Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of Romans, chapter number one. Romans, chapter number one. Todd, the message this morning is, you've got a call. You've got a call. Romans, chapter number one. Kind of unusual for a pastor to open up, preach from the beginning verses of a book of the Bible. But there's some thoughts from these verses that I'd like to give to you this morning. Romans, chapter one, start reading at verse number one. Paul wrote, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated from the gospel of God, which he had promised afford by his prophets in the Holy Scripture, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. I want to draw your attention to just one word, uh, repeatedly at least. It's found up in verse number one. It's found again in verse number six. It's the word called. Called. Notice again verse number six. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. You have a call. That's a term you may not have heard very much in the last 20 or so years. Those of us with a few years upon us remember what it was like when we didn't have cell phones, we just had a phone in the house. Typically that phone would be somewhere in the central part of the house, maybe, maybe in the kitchen. Uh, if you were rich, you might have two phones. You might have had one in one part of the house and one back in the bedroom. But most of us, at least me, uh, we, we only had one. It was centrally located. Uh, it might, be, might have been sitting on, a, on an end table or a coffee table or a counter. Uh, when things got sophisticated, they started hanging them on the wall. And if they hung them on the wall, maybe it was just outside the kitchen towards that end of the house, one of the more predominantly popular areas of the house. And in those days, there was no caller ID. There was no answer machine. You would know a different term. There was no voicemail in those days. And when the phone rang, it was the duty of whoever was the closest to that phone to answer it. It was really dangerous the way we lived. I mean, we didn't know who was calling. We didn't know who they wanted. And we didn't know what they wanted to talk to us about. We just had to pick the phone up and to answer it. And when that answer was made, most everybody would pause, just instinctively pause for a second to hear what was happening on that phone. If the person who answered the phone was talking, that meant it wasn't for you. You didn't have to worry about it. But if it wasn't for you, a cry would come through the house. Mom, Dad, it's for you. If it was a sibling, it wouldn't be quite so gracious. It would probably, hey, stupid, it's for you. <laughs> but what they were signaling was, you have a call. This morning I want to talk to you about the thought, you have a call. Three thoughts along that line. Number one, would you just notice some facts about this call? Notice again verse number six. He uses that phrase, you have been called of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a very important call that you have. It's a call from God. The call that I'm talking to you about this morning, you've got a call, a call from God. You can't get a more important caller than God Himself. Uh, let me describe it this way. It's the Holy Spirit of God calling you about what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for you. And He's offering you a call, an offer from the Father. So you've got the third member of the Trinity wanting to tell you about the second member of the Trinity, offering you a gift from the first member of the Trinity. And this is a call so important, you can't begin to refuse it. Years ago, I came across an article. It's one of those Ann Landers types of things. It, it, again, most everything I say is going to be, you have to have some years on you to, to remember the name Ann Landers or, or Dear Abby. First, let me say I didn't read that column, okay? I, I really don't know how I got this particular article. I might have heard a preacher preach. Or I might have seen it someplace. Uh, but, but the article, uh, that type of article, it asks questions 
And, and, it's, and Landers gave her answers. Uh, catch the, the question that was answered. The question was, I have received an invitation from the White House to attend a party, but I have a previous engagement. What is the proper way to decline the invitation from the White House? This was the question that was posed to Ann Landers. Her answer was, an invitation from the White House supersedes all other invitations and commitments. It cannot be declined. I've got news for you. You've got a phone call from somebody more important than whoever happens to be sitting in the White House of the United States. This call that I'm talking about is an important call. Uh, number two, this call, facts about the call, it's a person-to-person -person call. And again, I'm sorry, young folks, you just haven't lived yet. It's a person-to-person -person phone call. What does that mean? Uh, well, back before cell phones, they actually charged long distance when you called outside of a certain area. If you called inside of a certain area, it was within your normal charges, no extra fee. But if it was a long distance phone call uh, outside of your normal calling area, you had to pay an extra fee. Strange here in Green Pond, we're sitting on the edge of three counties. Uh, right here in Green Pond, I could make a phone call when I first came to this church all the way clear to the other side of Jefferson County. That's like 60 miles north. I could make a phone call all the way to the other side of Bibb County. That's like 40 miles west and south. But I couldn't make a phone call more than two miles to the east over to Tuscaloosa County. Tuscaloosa County was a different county. And for me to call two miles to a church member's house, two miles across that distance, I'd have to pay a long distance charge. So often in those days, we would make what you call person to person call. Now that way, when you call, the operator takes over. And she actually asks for the person that you want to speak to. And the long distance charge doesn't take effect until that person comes to the phone and answers the phone. So a person to person phone call kept you from being charged too long. And if the person just didn't want to answer the phone or wasn't available to answer the phone, then you didn't get charged the long distance call at all. Operator took care of all of that person to person. Now, this call that I'm taught, it's an important call, but it's a person to person call. This is God calling to speak to you. And, and, and this call that I'm talking about this morning, this isn't a call that's dependent upon wires that run across telephone poles or even some type of invisible waves that connect cell phones to cell phone towers. This is a spirit to spirit phone call. From God to you. This is a heart to heart phone call from God to you. You have a call. It's important. It's from God. It's person to person. It's from God directly to you. Now, having said these facts about this phone call, you perhaps are wondering, well, preacher, what's your part in this? My part's very small. Again, this is between you and God, person to person. I'm not in the phone call. My job is twofold. My job is to tell you the phone's ringing. Uh, it's sad, but we've gotten so busy in this world that we live in. And in some cases, we've gotten so hard that God tries to call us, and we never even hear the phone ring. I don't know, most of you can't associate with this now. you got cell phones. Mine's in my pocket. It's on mute right now. It automatically goes on mute so that I don't get phone calls during church. But it's kind of aggravating. You can't hardly ever get by with saying, I didn't hear the phone ring, because most of the time the thing's attached to your right hand. But in the old days, you could actually step outside the house and somebody might call and you'd never hear the phone ring. You get busy doing something else. You might not could get back to the phone in time to answer it. I'm here to tell you the phone's ringing. God is trying to call you. There's a second task that I have. I think God would have me to do this. I'm here to tell you the phone's ringing, number one. But number two, I'm here to help you to answer the phone. You know, it's amazing. Kids see an old rotary dial phone nowadays, and you can have some fun 
trying to get them to show you how to work it. Uh, they see that little dial on there. They've got no idea what in the world to do that. They see that handset on, on the top. Of it. They don't know what to do with that handset. Uh, maybe you saw the Beverly Hillbillies going back again a long, a long way. Uh, first time they ever picked up the phone, they had the thing turned upside down. Didn't know which end to speak in, which end to listen to. Uh, it's amusing when it's a child that doesn't know how to use an antique phone like what we were raised with. But I'm here because I've answered the phone before. I'm here because by the good grace of God, I've received a personal phone call from God. And I'd like to be able to help you to answer that phone call if it's possible. Number one, I want you to understand you have a call, just some basic facts about the call. Number two, the kinds of calls. The kinds of, number one, facts about the call. Number two, the kinds of calls. There's several different calls that God makes. There's four of them that I'll mention to you this morning. The most important of the four calls that God makes by far is the first one. If you answer the phone for the first one, the next three calls are automatic. You can't stop God from making the next three calls. But if you don't answer the first call, you will never hear the phone ring for the next three calls. What are the four kinds of calls? Number one, there's the call of salvation. The call of salvation. The call of salvation, most important call God issues. Because the only way, especially in this time period, that God ever communicates with a person is He begins by sending them the call of salvation. God's not going to talk to you about anything else until first God talks to you about your soul and your eternity. The call of salvation is a universal call. John chapter 3 verse 16 for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ died for the whole world. He died for a world of whosoever's. Now, it's important that you understand that because as I tell folks from time to time, there's a growing movement in the churches today to limit salvation to a select few. There's a thought that God didn't die for everyone. I've got news for you. If you're a whosoever and if you're part of this world, He died for you. The truth of the matter is you may never get saved. It's not required. It's not a have to. You may never get saved, but God wants you to get saved. The book of 2 Peter, Peter wrote, God is not slack concerning His promises, as some are, but long-suffering. Get this, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This movement that's afoot inside the churches today is that God selected some for heaven has determined randomly that some will go to hell. I'm sorry, that's just not what the Bible says. The Bible says if God was going to make a choice about your eternal destiny, if God was going to make the choice, He'd take us all to heaven. He's not willing. It's not the desire of God that any should perish. It's His desire that all would be saved. But God won't do that. Because among the many gifts that God has given, the two most valuable, the two most important of many gifts that God's given us, number one, He gave us Jesus Christ. By far, hands down, the most valuable, the most precious gift God's ever given, He gave us His Son. But I think probably the second most valuable gift that God's given to us is God gave us a free will. God lets us choose whether we'll go to heaven or go to hell. Some people have problems with that. They say, well, God is sovereign. God has to make all the choices. He is sovereign and He made the choice. He made the choice you get to choose. I don't understand why you can't accept that. So many folks have a problem. They think God is so small that He has to make all the choices and can't handle a situation where He gives you one. Let me tell you, He could let you make a billion choices. And He's so big He could handle every one. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Giving you the choice about whether you go to heaven or hell is not that complicated. There's only two places to pick from. 
And if you don't choose Jesus Christ, you're automatically picking the other place. And so God has given to you a gift, the gift of free will. And this morning, the phone's ringing. This morning, God's calling you. Jesus has already paid the price. And now he's trying to encourage you to come to his son. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse number 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to every man. What does that mean? Grace is God's power. It's God's work. It's God tugging. God tugs at every human being to come to His Son. There's no human being that has ever lived that the grace of God did not try to draw that person to His Son. He's provided the Savior. He's given you the gift of choice. And He's provided grace to pull you to Himself. But there's one fatal link in what God has done for us. One fatal flaw, at least for some, in this beautiful plan of salvation that God has done for us. That fatal flaw is us. He requires the saved to take the message of Jesus Christ to the unsaved. You see, the fact that Jesus has died for everybody does nobody any good if they don't know that. The fact that Jesus wants everybody to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ doesn't do any good if they don't know that. Even on that day where God begins to grab their heartstrings and pull them towards Him, they don't know where to go unless somebody has told them what Jesus Christ has done for them. That's the reason why Paul wrote in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse number 14. How shall they believe on Him? How shall they call upon Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's the reason somebody has to go tell somebody else what Jesus Christ has done for them. I don't know if you remember or not, but December of last year, I bought 3,000 chick tracks. 3,000 chick tracks. It took us a while to get them stamped. We put our names in them. And then it was either in January or February I started putting them out. And I, I asked the question. I, di I didn't really challenge the church, but I asked the question, do you suppose this church, the Green Pond Baptist Church, can give out 3,000 chick tracks in the course of a year? Uh, to me, that's a pretty mammoth task. That, I, at that time, I remember figuring out how much we, how many we'd have to give. It seemed like the number was somewhere around eight or nine a day that we would have to give out in order to give out 3,000. I'm glad to report to you that of the 3,000 tracks that we started with February, we probably have less than 100 of them on hand right now. I'm about to order another batch of chick tracks. Why? Because there's a world out there that can't call on a Jesus that they've not heard about. If there's a flaw in the plan of God, it's not that He picked some for heaven and some for hell. He didn't do that. If there's a flaw in the plan of God, it's because the, govern, the sovereign God chose us to take the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And I'm afraid we may not be doing a very good job of it. It's a universal call, number one. This call of salvation, universal. Number two, it's an urgent call. It's an urgent call. This call deals with human souls. We're not talking about flighty things like gold and silver. We're not talking about petty things like position and fame. We're not talking about temporal things like status and position. We're talking about something that lasts forever. The human soul. There's an urgency about this. There's an urgency that we tell as many folks as possible, the phone's ringing. There's an urgency that we help them to understand, you need to pick up that phone and answer it. There's an urgency because life is so short. And because eternity 
is so long. Jesus asked the question, Matthew chapter 16, verse number 26. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Might I tell you, if you could capture this entire planet and own every mineral, every resource, be the most famous, the most popular, the most powerful, it would avail you nothing three seconds after you've died. There's an urgency because it's about the eternal soul. Talking about this first call. The first call is the call of salvation. It's, it's a universal call. It's an urgent call. Number three, it's a unique call. It's a unique call. Again, you don't get it. If you're, if, if you're, we're cell phones now. Uh, about a year ago, we took out our landline. It took us many years to decide to take out our landline, uh, land primarily because I'm the pastor of the church. And I figured I needed my name in the phone book so that if somebody wanted to reach the pastor of the church, they'd be able to reach me. And there's no phone books for cell phones. And so we kept a self, uh, the landline for, for many more years. But last year, we got tired of feeding the telemarketers, so we just went ahead and took it on out. If you've only ever had a cell phone, you may not understand what I'm about to say. I think one of the reasons, there's many reasons why texting is so important. Number one, we got this cell phone, but nobody ever actually makes phone calls with it. Have you noticed that? What we do is we text and we get online with these smartphones. I think one of the reasons people like texting over calling, a lot of folks just don't like to talk, but one of the reasons is you can be relatively sure that eventually they're going to get your message. If you send a text, maybe they've got their phone with them, maybe they don't. Maybe they're going to read it right then, maybe they won't. But one of these days, you know they're going to pick that phone up again. And when they do, they're going to see that icon. They've got a text. It might be next week, it might be next month, it might be next. But one of these days, they're going to pick it up, and that text is still going to be there. It doesn't work that way with the phone. It especially didn't work that way with the phones when we had, that we had growing up. Again, we had no answering machines. There was no caller ID. There was no voicemail. If you didn't answer the phone while it was ringing, there was no record, there was no resemblance that anybody had called at all. If you wanted to find out who called, you'd have to pick up the phone and call everybody that you knew, and, and then you still might not have called the right person. There's no way that once the phone stopped ringing, you could return the phone call because you had no record of who had called you at all. That's much the same way this call of salvation is. If you don't answer the call while God is calling you, you may never have the opportunity to be saved again. You know, it's kind of ironic. We go out and we talk to people about Jesus every week. Uh, and sometimes we get opportunities during the course of the week to talk to additional folks. But it's interesting when you talk to people about Jesus who know that they're lost. And that's, that's a common condition now. There's a lot of people that know enough about the Bible to know that they're lost. But you talk to them about that and you try to urge them to accept Jesus. Now, what many of them will say is, I know I'm lost and I plan on getting saved one day. One day. What they don't understand is you can't just get saved anytime you want to. The only time a person can get saved is when the good God is calling them, is when He's drawing them. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to every man. But that doesn't mean it just keeps abiding there. God, God's Holy Spirit draws, but there's no guarantee that drawing will last forever. We've got an example back in the Old Testament. We've got a man by the name of Noah. He built an ark for 120 years. The Bible indicates that he preached. He preached and he preached and he preached. And anybody and everybody during that 120 years that had wanted to believe, had wanted to get on that ark, Noah would have reserved a spot for them. But at the end of the 120 years, God brought the animals to the ark. And then the Bible specifically says God shut 
the door. Doesn't say Noah shut the door. If Noah had shut the door, then there's a likelihood that Noah could have opened the door. But the Bible very carefully says that Noah brought the animals into the ark and then God shut the door. And then it began to rain. And it rained for 40 days. I don't know how fast the rains came. I imagine they were swift. I imagine that's the reason why we've got our petrol today. I, I imagine the currents got so swift it raked many, it swept many of the animals into local areas and they got compacted. And over the years they became what we would call coal and our fuel and our fossil fuels. But I suspect there was still time for some people to make their way to the ark and pound on that door. I suspect even as the currents begin to, to move and the water begin to rise, maybe some could have drifted or been carried over by the ark. There, there would have been no handles on the outside. It wasn't built for that. But, but, but they could have beat on the sides. And I suspect some could have cried and said, please let me in. I know I'm lost. I wanted to get saved. Is it, is it possible now? But God had shut the door. The call of salvation is unique. If you don't answer the phone when God calls you, why should you expect God's going to answer the phone when you call Him? Do you really think God is your servant? I really believe it should be understood. It's the other way around. It's a unique phone call. It must be answered while the phone is ringing. This call of salvation, it's the first call. It's universal. It's urgent. It's unique. Number three, I'll say it this way. It's not an unrelenting phone call. It's not an unrelenting call. By that I mean God won't barge into your life and make you answer it. I've spent some time thinking about this message. I can only find one person in all the Bible that I would come anywhere close to saying God barged into his life to save him. That would be the Apostle Paul, better known as Saul. I think it's Acts chapter number 9. Saul's on the road to Damascus. And as he's going with his letters to arrest other folks, God appears to him in what appears to be a great ball of light. Knocks him down to his knees. Paul's trembling. He hears a voice. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He asks the question, Who art thou? Lord? Jesus answers, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. If anybody ever had their life barged into, I'd have to say it was Saul. Saul of Tarshish who became Paul. But even then, even then, though God barged into his life, God didn't make the decision for Saul whether he gets saved or not. Saul himself finally had to say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And not only did he have to ask that question, but once he knew the answer, he had to follow up and do what God told him to do. It was still Saul's decision whether to get saved or not. Now I hear people say the strangest things. They say, well, I, I've never felt God. I've never seen any thunder. I've never heard any lightning when the preacher was preaching. I, I, I've, never really, I've never really seen where God barged into my life. Understand, for most of us, that's not the way God does it. For most of us, it's like Elijah in the Old Testament. Elijah had gotten discouraged. He felt like he was the only man still serving God. He fled out into the desert. He really wanted to die. Uh, he wasn't suicidal, but if he'd fallen off the edge of a cliff, he'd have been happy. And God appears to him, tells him through an angel, tells him, keep going, go out into the desert. He finds a cave and he crawls into the cave and he's waiting for God to show up. And there's thunder and there's lightning and there's storms and there's wind. And he's watching in the midst of all this sound and all this noise. And he's looking for God in the midst of all these things. He didn't see God in any of the thunder, the lightning, and the booming sound effects. But after everything got quiet, he heard a still Small voice. It was God's call. The still, small voice. The problem, the reason, 
why so many folks never hear the call of salvation is because they've always got so much going on in their life. Noise, television, entertainment, activities. They're never alone enough. They're never quiet enough where they can hear the still, small voice of God. For most of us, it's that still, small voice. But I'm here today to tell you, the phone's ringing. This call, the call of salvation, it's for you. Facts about the call. Types of call. First type of call. If you answer this, the other three will happen automatically. If you don't answer the call, the first call, call of salvation, you won't ever know about the other three calls. But the other three calls, the second type of call, first type of call, call of salvation. Second type of call, call of sanctification. Call of sanctification. Go back if you wouldn't look at the text. I believe it's verse number seven that I want to point your attention to. Paul, Paul writes in verse number seven, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Called to be saints. We don't use the word saints very much. We don't use the word sanctification very much either. To be honest, the Roman Catholics kind of hijacked it from us. Uh, they, have, they have declared that saints are dead people. Dead people that were very good people when they were alive. And, and so they, they have this process. If you were a very good person and you're dead, been dead for a good long while, they will make you into a saint. I want you to know that's just not what the Bible teaches. The saints that the Bible talks about are very much living people. Living people are saints. Living Christians are saints. And it's not so much that they're good, it's that Jesus Christ is living inside of them. And, it, and He causes them to do good things. So, this, this business of being sanctified is this business of being changed by Jesus Christ. When you get saved, you get sanctified, you get changed by Jesus Christ. We talk an awful lot in this church about the change that Jesus Christ brings. My life's verse 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But that's just one of, of dozens of verses in the Bible that talk about the change that happens when you get saved. Uh, add to it Galatians 3, 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Or Ephesians 4, 24, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Or Colossians 3.10, and, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. There's this thing that changes. There's, there's this thing that takes place in our life after we answer this first call, this call of salvation. It's the call of change. It's the call of sanctification. It's the call where God makes us into saints. Saints aren't dead people. Saints are living people. Saints aren't perfect people. They're not even necessarily good people. Saints are people that have been saved and they let Jesus Christ shine through their life. Now get what I'm saying. If you ever answered the call of salvation, the call of sanctification was automatic. It came automatically after the call of salvation. And God expects us to answer that call as well. There's a problem. If you're a, a Christian, but you've never really changed. There's not been a dramatic, permanent, total correction in your life that Jesus Christ has or is making in your life. Something's wrong. The phone is ringing. You need to answer it because just as surely as there's a call of salvation, there is also a call of sanctification. 
The third phone call, it's automatic as well. First one, by far the most important, call of salvation. Second one, call of sanctification. The third one, call of service. Call of service. Go back, look again at Romans, because all three of these calls are mentioned in the book of Romans. Look at verse number one. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Uh, his rank was apostleship, but his position was servant. He had called, been called by God to be his servant. Let me tell you a secret. If you've been saved, you've been called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, preacher, I don't have a rank like Paul did. Paul the apostle, he's got a fancy rank. Yeah, he's got a pretty fancy rank. Let me give you four words. Four words all start with an R, and then let me try to explain them to you. Rank, responsibility, reliability, reward. Four words, rank, responsibility, reliability, reward. I personally don't think God rewards us very much based on our rank or our responsibility, because God gives us both of those. Paul happened to have the rank of apostle. You say, well, I ain't got that rank. I hadn't either. There aren't any apostles nowadays. I happen to have the rank of pastor. But one thing you need to learn about these ranks, they're in reverse order. The higher the rank, the greater the servant. The higher the rank, let me put it this way, the lower the servant. Paul was an apostle. You know what that meant? He served every Christian that there was. That's what the duty of the apostle was. He served them all. I'm the pastor of the Green Pond Baptist Church. That's the calling God's given to me. That means I'm the servant of everybody that's a part of the Green Pond Baptist Church. Now, there are members of the church down the street. They've got their pastor. He's primarily their servant. Be my honor. I'd be happy to because it's my heart's desire. Be my honor to serve some of those folks over there too. But my calling is to serve the body that's here because this is where I'm the pastor. This is my rank. I'm the pastor of this church. That makes me the servant of all. So, understand when we're talking about ranks, these ranks don't lift us up. These ranks actually lower us down. So, if you've got a rank, it just means you're a greater servant. Probably means you've got greater responsibilities, but that's okay. I don't think God rewards us any based on our rank or our responsibilities. God gives us all of those. What God rewards us on is our reliability. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 2, Moreover, it is required in a steward that a man be found faithful. Hey, if you want a reward, you be faithful where you are. You don't have to be the pastor of this church. You don't have to be a deacon in this church. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher. Now, you could be some of those. You can't be a pastor. I'm sorry, that position's filled right now. Uh, but, but you could be a teacher. You could be a deacon. There's other positions that you could have inside the church. If you're willing to serve, because that's what the rank means. The higher the rank, the more service you render. But it's really not that essential that you have a rank. It's really not that important what your responsibilities are. Oh, what's really important is that you're faithful to whatever God has called you to. And if you are, get this, if you are, you're liable to get the same reward that that apostle got. Because the best he can do is be faithful. And the best you can do is be faithful. And if that's what the reward is based on, then the reward is based on our reliability. Number one, there's the call, the call of salvation. Number two, there's the call of sanctification. Number three, there's the call of servant. Number four, the last call that I'm on a mission, there's the call to be snatched away. I don't even have time to talk about that. But Paul talks about it over in the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter number four. He talks about being caught up with the Lord. Being caught up, that means being snatched up. The first three calls, salvation, sanctification, servant. If you've been saved, all three of those calls flow instantly from the same throne of grace. But if you're saved, we're all still waiting for the phone call to be caught up, snatched up. It could happen any time. If you're here and you're a believer, you ought to be looking and listening for the phone call 
It won't be the ring of a telephone. It won't be AT&T's fancy little logo sound. Oh, it'll be the sound of a trumpet. When you hear that sound, it means you're about to be snatched away. Number one, facts about the call. Number two, the kinds of call. There's four. Number five and last, the result of the call. The result of the call. If you hear the phone ringing and you answer the call, you become something very unique. Would you look back at verse number six one more time? Romans chapter one, verse number six. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ? Notice that article. The called. That means you become a part of an elite, special group. This phrase, the called, it's one more of those terms that applies to a special group of people. Other terms that could be synonyms would be the church which means the called out assembly. Another term, the elect, the born again, the saved. All of these terms could be used interchangeably. It means you become a part of a very unique and special group of people. Not special because of their own qualities or because of their own abilities, but special because they heard the call and they answered the call. They now are special. For all eternity, these people, the called, will be the sons and daughters of God. For all eternity, they'll live in this place called heaven. For all eternity, they'll have a relationship with Jesus Christ, with God the Father, with God the Holy Spirit. For all eternity, they'll be co-rulers with Jesus. Christ for all eternity they will enjoy the blessings of God himself the most special the most elite the most privileged people in the world the called the saved the born again the church the elect if you answer the call you become a part of of the most special people that God will ever create. This morning, would you answer the phone? You have a call. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the people to preach too. I pray God you'd speak to people's hearts this morning. All I can tell them is the phone's ringing. If there's somebody here and they're not saved, the phone's ringing. All I can tell them is if there's somebody here that's saved but they're not living for you is the phone's ringing, the call of salv- uh, sanctification. All, all I can tell them is, is, God, the call of service is ringing. God, please, today, would you speak to people's hearts? Would you cause people to answer the phone? Would you cause earthly lives to be changed?